So starting right off with the problem, getting things warmed up. We wanted to calculate the molarity of a solution made by adding 45.4 grams of sodium nitrate to a flask and dissolving it with water to create a total volume of 2.5 liters. So first, what is molarity? Moles per liter. Molarity, which is a capital M, is moles per liter. So this is like the most useful way to define it. And honestly, whenever there's a molarity problem, I always take a first step of rewriting it. So if I'm given something in molarity, rewrite it as some number of moles per liter. It's more descriptive. Um, especially when you're trying to work out a problem. Okay, so if molarity is moles per liter, and we wanna calculate the molarity of this solution, what do we need to find? Moles. Yeah, moles of sodium nitrate. Right, yeah, because this is moles of solute per liter of solution. So we take our 45, oops, that's 4.5, 45.4 grams NaNO3, and we can find a periodic table. So we have sodium, we have nitrogen, we have oxygen. One sodium, one nitrogen, three oxygens, and this is gonna be 22.99, 14.01, this Is this the one that comes out to 100 exactly? 22.99. plus. 14.01 plus three times 16, oh, 85 exactly. Uh, to 85.00 grams per mole nano three. So the molar mass, the mass of one mole. And then we can use this. Oh. That'll tell us the moles when we use this to convert. So 85.00 grams is equal to one mole. So 45.4 divided by 85. I'll put an equals here. 0 0.5341176475 because we're not done yet. What was NaNO3? So now we just need to take that and divide it by the number of liters. So I'm gonna actually write it like this, right? If we multiply that by one over the amount of liters, same thing as dividing. Yeah, so it's the total number of liters. And now here we're, we are kind of making an assumption that by adding the sodium nitrate, it's not gonna change the volume. Oh, perfect. Yeah, a lot of the time though, unless there's like multiple volumes being given, you're assuming that the volume stays the same, yeah. No, yeah, yeah, because how could you calculate it? It's, it's also weird because sometimes, 
Sometimes you add a solute and the volume goes down. Uh, yeah, so it causes the water to pack more tightly, but it's very, very slight. So we're just assuming here, we're not, we're not thinking about any of that. Yet I do, do you have any other chemistry. Uh, I don't. I don't have a specific example. I just know that it happens sometimes. I think it actually happens. Ooh. <laughs> this, is, yeah. this is one of those things I have an approximate knowledge of, so. All right, so we should get 0 0.214 molar NaNO3. Um, and that is all that I would expect on this. But I think one of the things that is important when you have concentrations of a solution, right, it's this concentration, but we could also say we have an amount of it, right? So this is two point, you might wanna write this as 2.50 liters of 0 0.214 molar NaNO3. Because both of those numbers are required to accurately describe what you have. Have some volume of some concentration. Already. So we can use this molarity. We can use molarity as a conversion factor between moles of solute and liters of solution. So for example, if we have 0 0.500 uh, molar sodium chloride solution and it contains 0 0.500 moles of sodium chloride for every liter of solution, right, we have this concentration, we have this number of moles, we could actually find how many liters of solution there are. So we would take our Let's see. Oh, sorry, sorry. It, this is the conversion factor, right? So if we had one liter of this solution, that would contain 0.5 moles. So you could be given a number of moles and a concentration, figure out what liter, what volume of solution you would have to have to contain that many moles. Or the other way around. So if we have, here, we have volume, we have molarity, but we wanna know how many grams of sucrose are in 1.55 liters of 0 0.758 molar sucrose solution. So what should we do first? <laughs> Write out what we know. 1.55 liters. So we have 1.55 liters, and it's of this 0 0.5758, sorry, molar sucrose. What can we do to that molar sucrose, though? Make it into moles per liter, moles per liter. All right, so this is the same as 0 0.758 moles of sucrose per one liter of solution. Most of the time I leave the solution part out. It's molarity, so it's implied. So if we wanna calculate grams of sucrose, given the information that we have, what information do we need to get? What do we need to calculate? Moles. So we start with, start with, and this is, this makes problems so much easier. You almost never start with molarity. So it's easier to work this problem out if you start with the fact that I have 1.55 liters of this solution, because now molarity is a conversion factor. And so if we write out our problem this way, we can plug that in. We can plug in this 0 0.758 moles sucrose over one liter, and our liters cancels out. Things get a little bit less clear if you start with molarity, because now you'd have 0 0.758 moles 
over one liter. And yeah, you could plug in a number here, but most of the time when we're plugging in numbers to this sort of railroad of conversions, uh, there's a number on top and bottom. So if you plug in 1.55 liters, you could put one underneath. But the 1.55 liters is not a conversion factor. Get rid of that. All right. So we don't have to just end the calculation there. So that'll give us moles of sucrose, and then we have to calculate grams of sucrose. So to get from moles to grams, what do we do? Molar mass. This is gonna be a big one. Only have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but we have 12 carbons. 22 hydrogens and 11 oxygens. So 12 times 12.01 plus 22 times 1.01 plus 11 times 16. This is 342.34 grams per mole sucrose. And again, also, right, you could just type this into your calculator. The reason that I write it this way with this weird notation that I made up is because you can type it into your calculator as 12 times 12.01 plus 22 times 1.01 plus 11 times 16. You don't have to do each of those individually and then add them together. So we want grams. 342.34 grams mole And we get 402 grams of sucrose. Hmm? Oh. You know, you know, you know what? You know what? Just. <laughs> oh. That silly program. How is the Alex homework going, by the way? We've had several of them. Good? Yeah. Yeah. Can you go back to any of the past homework assignments and like review those problems? I don't know. I think it, it might it might lock you out. I know it does this when we if you set up the if you set it up differently, it'll lock you out of anything else except for the module that's due. So it might lock you out of other things until you finish the homework assignment that's due, but I'm not sure. This is the first time I've set it up this way. Any questions about these calculations? They're more unit conversions. So if you take 25 grams of salt and you dissolve it in 251 grams of water, what would be the mass of the resulting solution? You can? Okay, that's good. Oh yeah, it's just closed for grading. So what would be the mass of the solution? Yeah. It seems maybe, I, I think it's, 
In some ways, it's intuitive. You've added mass to something, and so, of course, it's gonna get heavier. But also, it dissolves, so you can't see it anymore. Um, but it is still in there, regardless of it being dissolved or not. So this would be 276 grams, right? The mass is still add. All right, so solution to solutions. Um, we are gonna be like a lot of this stuff covering again in lab, going over those, but uh, so solutions, it's not very convenient to store a lot of really dilute solutions um, because they take up a lot of space. So normally solutions are sold, bought and sold, and stored as stock solutions, which are really concentrated. So like if you go into the back, we've got like 14 molar, um, nitric acid, 12 molar hydrochloric acid, I think hydrochloric is 12. Um, and so any of those things can by, be diluted by adding them, adding water to them. Uh, and for those dilution problems, and only for dilution problems, can't use this for stoichiometry, for dilution problems we can use this equation of M1V1 equals M2V2. And this works because when you're doing a dilution, you're not changing the number of moles in your solution of solute. The only thing you're changing is the volume of that solution. It's kind of like if you had, uh, if you're trying to make like M&M cookies and you had some dough that had a ton of M&Ms in it, you could dilute your dough in terms of M&Ms by adding more regular cookie dough. So you'd have fewer M&Ms per scoop per cookie, but you would still have the same number of M&Ms as what you started with. And so here we're calculating how much extra, well, essentially how many of those M&Ms and how dispersed those M&Ms are in the cookie dough. And again, just like everything, pretty much everything in chemistry, it's all tied together through these, through moles. So if we wanted to make or if we wanted to dilute a solution and prepare three liters of a 0.5 molar calcium chloride solution from a 10 molar stock solution, uh, we're taking that solution and we're diluting it by, um, what, 20 times? So we divide this by two, that would be five, and then divide that by 10, you'd get 0.5. So in our three liter volumetric flask, what if we get to, uh, might get to use these actually, hopefully. We take the, we could do these calculations first, is what you would do actually. And then you'd figure out how many milliliters of your 10 molar stock solution you need to add. Um, and then we would know the final concentration that we want and the final volume. And we'd calculate that we need the uh, 0.15 liters. So you add that in and then you dilute it with water up to the mark and that gives you that exact concentration. And then the calculation they're doing down here is just to say that, look, it's still 1.5 moles in both of these solutions. So if we wanted to do this with a different solution, make a different concentration, the question here is what volume should you dilute 100 milliliters of a five molar calcium chloride solution to obtain a 0 0.75 molar calcium chloride solution? So the word dilute is in here, right? So we're diluting, we're doing a dilution problem. Uh, our equation is M1V1 equals M2V2. And really what you assign here as being M1V1 or M2V2 doesn't really matter. The only thing that matters is that your concentrated and the concentrated volume are on the same side as the diluted and the diluted volume. Diluted concentration, diluted volume. Uh, and it's sometimes easier to think of M1 or V1 as your initial conditions. So what would M1 be, whoops. Yeah, M, capital M here, molarity. So our concentration one, we're gonna make that five molar CaCl2. 
So what's V1? 100 milliliters. M2. 0 0.750. And V2. That's what we want to find, right? That's what we're looking for. If we filled that in, then the problem would already be solved. It's our last space left over here. So we can plug all these in. Uh, molar times V2. So a little bit of magic here. Notice I didn't convert it into liters. Why don't we need to convert it into liters? Doesn't matter. So the only thing that it does determine though is what V, the units of V2. So we're gonna take this five molar and I'm actually gonna rewrite this as 5.00 moles per liter times 100 milliliters equals 0 0.750 moles per liter times V2. And so if we wanna get V2 by itself, we divide both sides by 0 0.750 moles per liter. And when we do that, we get 0 0.750 moles per liter. And so, Moles per liter divided by moles per liter, those all cancel out. And we'll be left with only units of milliliters. So five times 100 divided by 0 0.750 is going to be 6 point, not 6 point, sorry, 666. Uh, but we have three sig figs, so we're gonna round it at 667. And again, moles, liters, moles, liter, those will cancel. The only thing that doesn't is milliliters. And these both cancel completely. Well, 667 milliliters. You could convert it into liters. You can convert it, uh, 100 milliliters to 0.1 liters, do the whole problem. Your answer will just be in liters instead of milliliters. That's not the same for stoichiometry problems. There you do have to do it in liters. Because we're trying to calculate moles directly first. Okay, questions about solutions? Solution dilutions? Excellent. Solution stoichiometry now. Really all that we've added to this, this is like, it's still stoichiometry, it's just with solutions because we have a new way to calculate moles. So before we were always calculating moles from grams using molar mass. Now we're just saying, oh, well, if we know the volume and the molarity, we can calculate moles now again with those new, new numbers, new concentrations. And then we're still gonna use a mole ratio uh, from a balanced chemical equation to figure out how to convert between moles of A to moles of B. So what volume of a 0 0.150 molar nitric acid solution will completely react with 35.7 milliliters of a 0 0.108 molar solution according to the following balanced chemical equation? I think we should write out what we're given as is the way. So 1.50 molar HNO3, 35.7 uh, milliliters. And actually we should probably write this out as 35.7 milliliters of 0 0.108 molar Na2CO3, and then what we're trying to find is really the volume of 
nitric acid, and specifically of the 0 0.150 molar nitric acid. What would our solution diagram look like? What do we start with? Well, if we start with the molar, that's molar, molarity, that doesn't tell us how many moles of that we have. Not just straight from molarity. We don't know the volume of it. So, yeah, this would be moles per liter. We need to multiply by liters to get the number of moles. So that's actually what we're gonna be working back towards. We'll use this on the back side to get to the volume of that solution to use. How can we calculate moles with the numbers that we're given? Yeah, we're gonna start out with this volume of the sodium carbonate, and we wanna convert that into liters. Uh, the easiest way to convert from milliliters to liters is to move the decimal place three places to the left. So we take three, uh, sorry, 35.7, goes one, two, three. Those are gonna be 0 0.0357 liters. So 0 0.0357 liters of Na2CO3. Really with any stoichiometry problem, you gotta start with the, whatever you can calculate moles from. And so the only way we can calculate moles in this problem is to take this and then multiply it by molarity. So we take our 0 0.108 moles per one liter in A2CO3. Now I've got the uh, moles of sodium bicarbonate. Sodium bicarbonate? Sodium carbonate. Just sodium carbonate. So how do we get from, well, what are we trying to get to? Volume of nitric acid. What do we need to find the volume of nitric acid? Moles of nitric acid. So we've got moles of sodium carbonate, and we wanna to get to moles of nitric acid. So what do we use to, for that conversion? Mole ratio. Uh, so the mole ratio here is gonna be one mole, Na2CO3, two moles, HNO3. And then, one last step, because we know what the concentration of the solution is going to be, right? This 0 0.15 molar nitric acid is the same as saying 0 0.15 molar, or 0 0.15 moles per liter of nitric acid. So we wanna cancel out moles, we wanna get liters. Uh, and this is gonna be 0 0.150 moles HNO3, one liter HNO3. So 0 0.0357, and then we know, we know that we're done, or you can know that you're done because, well, I guess we're one step off technically. It wants, the, it wants the volume in milliliters. I'm gonna go ahead and calculate this now, but then we'll have to convert that. But, right, we've gotten the volume. And so, liters to milliliters, pretty simple. You could add it into your equation here, multiply across the top, divide by the bottom. So this is gonna be 0 0.0514 liters. HNO3 
solution. And so we can do the opposite of what we did earlier. So if that's liters, if we move the decimal place three places to the right, now we get 51.4 liters of 0 0.150 molar HNO3. Sorry, yes, milliliters, thank you. What shortcut could we have taken on this problem? I didn't do it because it's a little bit of a next level thing. It's not complicated, but you need to have a reason for doing it. Oh yeah, we could, we could. Yeah, so if you converted this to a thousand milliliters, that would work. The other thing you could do is if you just started with milliliters, your result at the end will be in milliliters. So you can kind of skip that conversion, but you need to know that you can do that because you're starting with milliliters and because you'll end with milliliters, and so that's what your units are gonna be on the backside. But you could incorporate that uh, conversion directly, yeah. It does cancel out. So the, cause, uh, just, you, you're saying just do this one? No, the other one. Oh, just do this one. Yeah. Well, here I did convert this into liters. Yeah, and you could make this a thousand to convert it into milliliters. But I'm saying you could have started with the 35.7 milliliters here, yeah, yeah. and then your answer at the end would come out as milliliters. Cause all the units in between cancel. But again, always safer to do all the conversions so that they work out. All right, last slide here uh, for this, what was left of chapter five. So if we took this reaction, this is a bit related to uh, what we're gonna do in lab even. All right, what is the limiting reactant if you mix equal volumes of a one molar solution of A and a one molar solution of B? Huh? We have equal concentrations and equal volumes. Which one runs out first? Well, does this say, is this saying that we have two moles of A or we need two moles of A? We need two moles of A. Or you would have to have two moles of A for this reaction to happen. So really these coefficients here tell you that A is gonna be used up twice as fast. Because for every B that we use up, we use two of A. This is, uh, yeah. The, uh, the tricky thing about the dilution, right? Should you M1V1 equals M2V2? You can be tricked into thinking that it's okay to use that sometimes. If there's a one-to-one -one ratio between the things that you're calculating and a solution stoichiometry problem. Because if the moles are one-to-one, -one, that's essentially what's happening when you do a dilution, but it's not always the case. And so the problem with using M1V1 equals M2V2 is that it doesn't have a mole ratio incorporated. And so if your ratio is anything other than one, you'll get the wrong answer. Uh, we can also show this mathematically real quick. So if we have equal volumes, and of course, whenever you're told equal volumes, pick the easy, or well, whenever you need to pick a number essentially for a problem, pick the easiest number. So what would be the easiest number for this problem, for volume? How many liters? One. All right, so if we say one liter, so if we have one liter of solution A, that means we're gonna have one liter of solution B, 
and we can multiply that by uh, the molarity, which is one molar A, or we could say one mole per one liter of A. Um, and then in any limiting reactant problem, we're still calculating what the, we wanna calculate one of the products. We don't wanna calculate these for each other. So, all right, I should, sorry, I should do it this way. Nope, that's not what I wanted. So then our ratio from A to C is gonna be two moles of A, one mole of C. And so with the amount of A that we can have, or the, the amount of A that we do have, we can make 0 0.5 moles of C. And then just setting up the same thing for B, this is one mole of B, one liter. Now this is one mole of C for one mole of B. And so here we can make one mole of C. So A is the limiting reactant. This is also a distinction that I've not done a, the best job of making clear is that the limiting reactant is the reactant. So A here is the limiting reactant. Your theoretical yield would be 0.5 molar, moles of C. All right. Uh, let's see. So here we're really gonna talk about reaction types and uh, we'll come back into solution stuff. But we gotta cover a few of these reactions first. We kind of talked about last time uh, not last time, I mean this was like, well yeah, last time, two weeks ago, we talked about what happens when you add something to a solution. And for ionic compounds that are soluble, they dissociate, right? They break apart into their ions. Uh, that is not the case for all ionic compounds. So uh, for those ionic compounds that are soluble, again, they dissociate, and so you get something like sodium sulfide, you get sodium ions, you get sulfide ions. Actually, I'm gonna pass these out. Here, take one of those, pass it around. These are just from the backs of old exams. They're, they have a solubility table on them though, which is useful. Same one that's in the book. Um, and then if you have a polyatomic ion, Right, so an ionic compound with a polyatomic ion, your polyatomic ions stay together. Um, so the thing that really determines the solubility, and I didn't put this slide in here, but it's the ability of the, or the strength of the interactions between the water and the ions, and the ions and each other. So if the water is stronger than the ions, then it falls apart and it dissolves in the solution. If it's not, then most of it does not dissolve. Although, everything is slightly soluble in water, just to a very, very tiny extent sometimes. Um, I think, yeah, no, in this class we're not gonna, we're not really gonna consider those situations where, like how much of slightly soluble compounds, or what, what we'll consider for now to be insoluble compounds, how much of those dissolve, that's a Chem 2 concept to calculate that stuff. You need to know uh, kinetics and equilibrium. <clears throat> so yeah, there's a lot of uh, factors that go into whether or not something's going to dissolve. It's really not easy to predict. Um, and so really what we're using for this class are these uh, solubility rules. So these are uh, qualitative assessments. Somebody went and they added, they added this substance to water and they figured out how much dissolved, and they added another substance, they said, does it dissolve, does it not dissolve? And developed a table of rules based on that information. So that's the one that I gave to you guys. And um, in terms of, okay, these ones. Um, I'm still debating on whether or not I'm actually gonna give these to you guys, because they are worth memorizing at least the major trends. Um, 
and that's the thing to remember is to try and try and find trends within this, especially these things that have no exceptions. So lithium, sodium, potassium, and ammonium, no exceptions, always soluble. Nitrate and acetate, no exceptions, always soluble. You should memorize those ones. And you should also memorize that for the most part, chlorine or chloride, bromide, and iodide are soluble. And uh, sulfate is also for the most part soluble. Of course, there are some of these exceptions, but even then you can find trends here that like silver with these compounds is going to be insoluble or lead with these compounds is going to be insoluble. So actually, sorry, I should have covered the way to read this. So the top half of this, mostly soluble. The exceptions are the situations where they're insoluble. On the bottom half, these are mostly insoluble compounds, and the exceptions are where they're soluble. So another trend I'd like to point out is that these lithium, sodium, potassium, and ammonium, those are the exceptions for hydroxide and for sulfide. So there's overlap there, right? Those compounds are still going to be uh, soluble. Now things change a little bit here, and calcium, strontium, and barium are going to be insoluble, are gonna be soluble, sorry, when they're paired with sulfide. And then we're, gonna cons we're really gonna talk about these. It says slightly soluble. Uh, consider those to be um, insoluble. So those hydroxide compounds, uh, for the purposes of this class, are insoluble. And then again, the same, right, kind of finding patterns in here, that the lithium, sodium, potassium, and ammonium for carbonate and phosphate are soluble, but everything else is going to be insoluble. So trying to make groups in your mind, and then um, this is one of those things that I would study by coming up with your own sort of chart, like draw circles, draw Venn diagrams, that kind of thing. Practice that, and practice it in a way that makes sense to you, and then sort of draw and redraw that graph, that chart for yourself over and over and over again until you can do it completely from memory. Um, probably the easiest way to do that. All right, so this is why I gave you those solubility rules, so I don't have to keep swiping up and down back to it. Is nickel sulfide soluble or insoluble? Nickel sulfide, yeah, sulfide's generally insoluble. How about magnesium phosphate? Yeah, so phosphates, uh, unless they're with those always soluble compounds, are gonna be insoluble. Lithium carbonate. Yeah, lithium's one of those always solubles. Is that soluble? And then ammonium chloride. Soluble. So especially, yeah, sodium, potassium, lithium, ammonium. Yeah, okay, making sure I got them all. Those ones definitely memorize those. It just helps to be able to like at a glance say, oh yeah, that thing's soluble. All right, so this is important because I'm gonna talk about precipitation reactions. So hard water, uh, which is a problem around here. Uh, I still need to go through and like scrub, like, uh, well, if you have at home, right, the shower, bathtub, bless you. Any of that's gonna get this stuff on it if you don't wipe it off. So our uh, house that we rent has these glass shower doors and all the water droplets that dry on there leave little spots of you know calcium or um, magnesium carbonate. And then again, this is tying back into those uh, net ionic equations. 
So calcium plus carbonate is gonna make calcium carbonate, and that's gonna be a solid. Huh? Why is there calcium and magnesium in the water? Because most of our water here comes from underground, and there's just amounts that are dissolved. So like the stuff that's coming up with um, the water that comes out of the ground, out of the aquifer, that's the word I was looking for, um, it's all soluble, but whenever water splashes onto something and the water evaporates, it then concentrates and becomes insoluble. Um, so you have to use like a vinegar to clean it off. So precipitation reactions are where you form a precipitate or a solid in mixing two solutions. So you have two solutions, both clear, both completely soluble compounds. As soon as you mix them together, uh, you'll see usually it's cloudy or there'll be um, usually, or like a color forms and it's not transparent. That's kind of one of the keys here is it's a change in the solution that you can't see through and then doesn't dissipate, right? It doesn't go away, it stays there. Um, I also like to tie this to, that we talk about, well right now especially, there's a lot of precipitation outside. So that's liquid water forming out of air, right? So there's water vapor, gaseous water, um, when it comes into the right con uh, conditions, precipitates. And so it's kind of the same thing, except now we're taking two liquids and we're forming a solid out of those. So precipitation reactions, we can predict what the products are gonna be. Um, we'll have our original compounds. So here, one of these solutions is potassium iodide, that's this one. And the other one is potassium nitrate, that's down here. And we're always going to be taking the cation from one and pairing it with the anion of the other. So they kind of trade partners. And so this is also called a double displacement reaction. The negatively charged ions are displacing each other. And then that predicts your possible products. Because you'll never have two positively charged ions forming a compound or two negatively charged ions forming a compound because like charges repel each other. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the attraction between the lead and the iodide is stronger than the lead to the water or the iodide to the water. And so it's kind of like if you added, um, actually in the Chem 20 book, there's a picture that has like magnetic marbles. So if you had regular marbles and magnetic marbles, when you pour magnetic marbles in with the regular marbles, they'll find each other essentially and click together and they'll push out all of the other non-magnetic marbles. So that's kind of what's happening here. The opposite charges, the opposite charges are just strong enough to overcome the water. Uh, that doesn't always happen though. So this is the one situation, well, I guess one of the situations where if you go to predict a product and you look at the products and neither of those forms a solid, a liquid, or a gas, everything remains aqueous, then there's no reaction, nothing happens. You've poured these two solutions together and gotten nothing. Except now you've got four ions together in solution. So only insoluble compounds will precipitate. And it's for these kinds of reactions, um, oh, getting ahead of myself. So to write the equations for precipitation reactions, Here's a little general procedure. So you start by writing the formulas for your two reactants. Then below the equation, write the formulas of the uh, products that could form from the reactants. And then refer to solubility rules to determine whether any of the possible products are soluble. So if all of your possible products are soluble, write no reaction. If any of the products are insoluble, then you write the formulas of all the products, indicate what's solid and what's aqueous, with you know parentheses S, parentheses AQ, balance your equation. So in practice, you'll be given a problem that looks like this. All right, when ammonium chloride and iron nitrate mix, predict, predict the reaction, predict the products. 
So what's the formula for ammonium chloride? Yep, NH4, Cl, that's gonna be aqueous. And then what's iron, iron three nitrate? Fe, NO3, three. All right, so the way that I'd recommend to do this, when you're predicting these products down below, just swap the positively charged ions. So I'm gonna take iron and I'm gonna write it under over here. So it's gonna be Fe three plus, and then I'm gonna write ammonia over here, NH four plus. Because you can end up sort of double swapping things, so you end up with exactly the same thing. Um, this way, by writing the cation, always writing the cations first and always writing them swapped, now we just drop the anions down. So we're gonna get iron chloride and ammonium nitrate. And at this point, we don't necessarily need to balance anything in terms of charges, because that would be more work. And if there's no, sol if there's no insoluble product, then there's no reaction, and we don't wanna do that. If there is a soluble product, then writing the charges in makes it easier to balance those charges to get the proper products. Uh, next, in the next step. So do we end up with a reaction? Is iron three chloride not soluble? Or insoluble? All right then. I expected that to be a product, honestly. <laughs> All right, so yeah, see, we saved ourselves a little bit of time. No reaction. Nothing else to do. That would be your answer. All right. Any questions there? No? How about the reaction of sodium hydroxide and copper two bromide? What's sodium hydroxide? Now, and uh, copper two bromide. Du, Br two. And then just gonna follow the same procedure here. All right, so copper two plus, I'm just swapping my cations. And then you can drop your anions down. This is gonna be OH minus, Br minus, and our, well, do we have a reaction? Where do those extra solubility rules end up? The extra ones, oh, over there. Projector's crooked. <coughs> so are there, is there a reaction? C. All right, the copper hydroxide is going to be insoluble because hydroxides in general are insoluble. So now we can take these and rewrite them. Copper is gonna be copper OH2. That's a solid. And I guess down here, you could also, in this space, say, okay, well, copper's a two plus, hydroxide's a one minus, so I need two hydroxides to balance out the charge on copper. And then this will be plus Na, Br. And now we gotta balance it. So how do we balance this? Mm-hmm. Yep. Ugh. A, U, there we go. The rest is gonna be aqueous, and so if we wanted to, yeah. 
we could write a complete ionic equation for this also and write a um, net ionic equation from that. Which of course is what we're gonna do, not for this problem, but for another. So I think the, the key thing that gets missed on these problems is just correctly swapping the ions and then predicting if there's gonna be a product. So as long as you keep the same procedure, like I showed you here, just swap those cations first, then you don't even have to do it here, you could do it on the other side, and then bring those anions down. All right, so we already covered this, but I wanted to put it in here as review. Uh, so our complete ionic equations, we're taking everything that's not solid, liquid, or gas, and we're splitting it, dissociating it into its ions. So for this equation here, lead nitrate and uh, potassium chloride, we get PB2 plus, and then two NO3 minus, because there were two nitrates uh, with the lead, so it helps, keeps things balanced. We get two potassiums, two chlorides. The lead chloride here is solid, that stays together, and then the other, other components get written as ions. Then taking this and going to the net ionic equation, we're just taking all of those, we're called spectator ions, right? They're just watching, they're not participating and we cancel them out. We say, okay, you guys don't matter, the spectators, and you end up with only the ions in the solution that participate in the reaction. So in a precipitation reaction, it's the two ions that combine to form the solid. Cool. Uh, so we're also gonna talk about acid-base and gas evolution reactions. Um, oftentimes the Acid-base reactions are also uh, gas evolution reactions. They're producing a gas. Right? So some of these reaction types are not exclusive. Right? It could be more than one. Uh, Acid-base reactions are also called neutralization reactions. So reacting an acid with the base, they neutralize each other, producing water. Um, I think last two weeks ago, when we last had a lecture, I showed you some reactions where and I told you that any neutralization reaction, acid-base neutralization reaction, you're gonna get H plus, OH minus, and water as your reaction. There are some other reactions, like these gas evolution reactions, uh, that you just kinda have to memorize. So what are acids? Um, it's not like in the cartoon. Have you guys seen Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Yeah. It's like super old now. <laughs> Now, it's not acid in that, but I think like the Hollywood acid is uh, like the vat of like toluene or paint thinner that they dip the cartoons in, right? You dip it in and then pull it out and it's just a skeleton. Uh, not really what acid is in chemistry. There are acids that'll do that. Don't get me wrong, but they're not all like that. And the ones that we'll use are not like that. They also do scarier things. Um, anyways, so the Arrhenius definition of an acid is the one that we're gonna use. Um, and an Arrhenius acid is any substance that produces H plus in aqueous solution. So if we add uh, HCl to a solution, it dissociates to produce H plus, and then also a chloride ion. Now, this is a, uh, in some ways a technicality, in some ways it's something you need to know about. In a solution of water, there is never H plus by itself. Hydrogen uh, by itself with a charge is highly reactive, so it's always associated with another water molecule and forms what we call hydronium, and that's this H3O plus. That being said, they're written interchangeably. Um, and most of the time I'll write it like this, just H plus. <clears throat> you can also have polyprotic acids, so things like sulfuric acid, it's a diprotic acid, so it's got two hydrogens, and both of those hydrogens can be removed, um, but they do so sequentially. So the first acid will come off, or the first hydrogen comes off, and then if you add enough base, the second hydrogen will eventually come off. Uh, you can also have triprotic, a triprotic acid, like phosphoric acid, H3PO4. There's four possible hydrogens, that, or sorry, three possible hydrogens that can be removed. Yep, 
all the, uh, yeah, all the polyprotic acids deprotonate sequentially. And it gets harder and harder with each proton to remove it, essentially. So like, for example, here, uh, sulfuric acid is a strong acid for that first proton, but it's a weak acid for the second proton. So it only dissociates partially. On the opposite side of these acids, we have bases. So the Arrhenius definition of a base is a substance that produces OH minus in a solution. So sodium hydroxide is an Arrhenius base, because again, add it to the solution and it dissociates. And it dissociates into hydroxide, so it's adding that to the solution. Uh, ammonium, or sorry, ammonia, NH3 is ammonia, is a special base. It doesn't actually directly produce OH minus, but it steals hydrogens from water and then produces OH minus that way. And that's a weak base. Yeah, so if you have NH3 plus H2O, it will take one hydrogen from water. So you'll get uh, NH4 plus plus OH minus. Yeah, it directly is adding those hydroxides, yeah. And then these are somewhat similar to polyprotic acids um, because they produce, can produce more than one hydroxide. So something like strontium hydroxide can produce two hydroxides in solution. The difference is that strong bases like this, uh, both of those hydroxides come off at the same time and they always dissociate completely. So in these acid-base reactions, we have acid, we have base, right? something that produces hydrogen, something that produces hydroxides. The hydrogen combines with the hydroxide to produce water. Oh, yeah, right here, right? H plus plus OH minus gives you water. And then you also get a salt. And this is the chemistry-specific generic salt, which is an ionic compound that dissolves in water. Actually, it might not even just be dissolved in water. The ionic compounds are also called salts. Sodium chloride is just one salt. If you buy um, like sea salt for cooking, it's got other things in it. It'll have like magnesium chloride. Um, I should look up specifically what all the other ones are, but there's different salts in there, and that's why it tastes different. And again, the net ionic equation for these acid-base reactions uh, involving a strong acid at least, are always gonna be H plus plus OH minus gives you H2O because the salt is going to be soluble. Uh, so you're not really gonna see much happen in a lot of these. So hydrochloric acid plus sodium hydroxide, if it's dilute enough, nothing really happens. If it's concentrated, uh, it can generate a lot of heat. But unlike precipitation reactions, right, we're not seeing, in this one specifically, you're not seeing uh, a solid form, not even seeing bubbles form in this case. But last week, if you neutralized your uh, acid solution like you were supposed to with the sodium bicarbonate, baking soda, uh, that does produce a lot of bubbles. And that's, actually we'll talk about gas evolution reactions also. Some uh, common acids bases. Hydrochloric acid is HCl, hydrobromic acid. We talked about how to name these. Um, all of these are strong acids. These are weak acids. So the only binary weak acid that we're gonna deal with is hydrofluoric acid. And then formic acid and acetic acid are gonna be the weak acids, mostly acetic acid. We're gonna tease that on Wednesday. Uh, in terms of bases, almost all the bases are gonna be strong bases. The exception is ammonia, which is that special weak base. Oh, actually, one last thing I wanna point out. Notice that the, uh, all of these bases are just alkali or alkali earth metals. 
with hydroxide. So pretty easy to identify a base, strong base especially. They all work the same way. All right, so write a molecular and net ionic equation for the reaction that occurs between hydrobromic acid and lithium hydroxide. So we have HBr plus LiOH. And then what are the, yeah, aqueous. What are the products? One of them's always water, a liquid, and then lithium bromide, which is aqueous. Because aqueous is always soluble. I mean, uh, <laughs> lithium is always soluble. All right, so what's the uh, net ionic equation for this? Aqueous, aqueous, plus lithium, plus aqueous, plus OH minus aqueous, H2O liquid, plus Li plus aqueous, plus Br minus aqueous. Sorry, that's the complete ionic equation. Now, yeah, what are our spectator ions? Bromine, theum. So we get them out of there. H plus plus OH minus. Oops, I don't know why I wrote another line. Net ionic equation, so this is the net ionic is the molecular So that's when a strong acid is involved. Uh, we talked about how solids, liquids and gases uh, remain in the complete ionic equation and also in the net ionic equation. The other thing that we need to add are weak acids and weak bases, which I think we talked about but didn't really cover. So in a reaction involving a weak acid, that weak acid is going to stay as uh, whatever its formula is. So I want to write a net ionic equation for this reaction. We'll have HC, I'll do the molecular first. And so HCHO2. Oh, formic acid. And then sodium hydroxide. And what are the products going to be? Water. And what's the other product? Sodium formate. <laughs> That's good. My new favorite compound, nacho. I mean, sodium formate. Oh yeah, sorry. Well, yeah, this is, sorry, this is the molecular. So this is our molecular equation, so that's gonna be aqueous. All right, so then our complete ionic equation what is our complete ionic equation? It's a weak acid, so it stays together. Yeah, so this stays as HCHO2 because it's a weak acid. But it'll be plus Na plus plus OH minus you know this one stays together 
But what about nacho or sodium formate? Yeah, it's not a weak acid anymore. So this would dissociate, so this will be Na+. So this is the molecular. This is the complete. So then what are the spectator ions? Yeah. So because we kept that formic acid, the HCHO2, because it stayed together in our complete ionic equation, um, it's not a spectator ion. Our only spectator ion is sodium. So that's the only one that gets removed. And then it's HCHO2. Plus OH minus. Gives us H2O plus CH, oh sorry, there's a charge on this, CHO2 minus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not gonna worry about that, but yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's chem two. All right. One, so well, there are any questions about this? So you do need to just kind of memorize the weak acids. For now, sodium formate, acetic acid, all right, sorry, not sodium formate, formic acid, acetic acid, uh, hydrofluoric acid. Uh, yeah. All right, so acid base titrations. Um, yeah, we'll introduce this. I mean, we'll get we'll have lecture on Wednesday also, so we can talk about it more then, but I do want to introduce this before we actually, before you write name in brief and before you have to do the lab. Um, so in a titration, a substance of a known concentration is uh, reacted with another substance in a solution of unknown concentration. So you add one solution to the other until the reactants are in their stoichiometric ratio, so they're equal, their equivalence point. The unknown concentration is then calculated from stoichiometry. Uh, most of the time, your reactant and product solutions are colorless, so you add an indicator. So if you've done titrations in the past, your solution turned pink when you hit the equivalence point. So your indicator there was phenolphthalein. Um, yeah, when large changes in acidity or basicity uh, occur. So the equivalence for an acid-base titration, and there are other types of titrations. Uh, you can do a oxidation reduction titration. But for acid-base titrations, the number of moles of H plus equals the number of moles of OH minus. And we haven't talked about pH yet, but your pH would be seven at that point, or close to. Uh, so the analogy that I used last semester in Chem 20, and it's my new favorite analogy, is this is a way, a roundabout way of counting things in the solution. And specifically, what we really care about is the number of moles in the solution. Because whenever you're doing a titration, especially an acid-base titration, um, you're gonna know the volumes of each of the solutions pretty exactly. So for your solution in this bottom flask, usually add that with a volumetric pipette. So we know what that volume is, and it's not the volumes of solution that'll be equal, and it's not even the concentrations of the solution that'll be equal at the end, but the number of OH minuses in this case that we add to the H pluses, those numbers will be equal. So my analogy for this was if you're, uh, you know, at a, you're the ice cream man for this kid's birthday party, right? So you go to the park, there's all these kids running around. The kid's birthday part, the kid whose birthday party it is, he's super popular. He's got like 100 plus friends. You have no idea how many they are. So you brought 1,000 ice cream sandwiches. And every kid gets an ice cream sandwich, and then just to make sure that nobody comes back in line, you stamp them on the forehead to 
indicate that they already got their ice cream sandwich. So you know that you started out with a thousand ice cream sandwiches, and then every kid comes through, you can hand them an ice cream sandwich, stamp them on the forehead, hand them an ice cream sandwich, stamp them on the forehead until all of the kids have gotten one. And then you count how many ice cream sandwiches you have left. And the difference between that and the, the amount that you handed out, or I guess the difference between what you started with and what you ended with is the amount that you handed out. And that's essentially what we're doing here, except the ice cream sandwiches are hydroxide ions, and the little kids are hydrogen ions. And the hydrogen ions are more honest than the little kids are, and they'll only ever grab one. <laughs> so we know how many hydroxide ions are up here, and as you empty that out, you figure out how much volume you lost, how much you delivered to the solution. Using that, you can calculate how many ice cream sandwiches you handed out, or hydroxide ions, and then from there, you know that the amount you handed out is the amount of H plus ions, or kids that got ice cream sandwiches. So that's all we're doing. It's a roundabout way of saying, oh, I handed out this many things, that must mean that there were this many people at the party. Know the molarity of the solution. So actually, for this next lab, you're gonna do two titrations. Your first titration will be to figure out the exact concentration of your sodium hydroxide. The second titration will be to figure out the concentration of the acetic acid using your um, standardized, it's called standardization, using your standardized sodium hydroxide. Um, and for that second, actually I think for both reactions, you'll be using phenolphthalein as the indicator, so when it turns pink, um, that's when all the kids have gotten an ice cream sandwich. Uh, let's see. We'll, read, we'll do this problem on, uh, yeah, let's do it now, let's do it now. And then we'll take a break and then we'll go, we'll hop into lab. Yeah, that actually works out perfect. Uh, okay, so if we wanted to titrate a 20 milliliter sample of a sulfuric acid solution of unknown concentration, Oh, sorry, the titration of this sample uh, requires, of unknown concentration, requires 22.87 milliliters of a 0 0.158 molar potassium hydroxide solution to reach the equivalence point. What is the concentration of the unknown sulfuric acid solution? So first, what is the equivalence point? Uh, that's the concentration of the, the hydro potassium hydroxide that we added. But what does it mean to reach the equivalence point, I guess? Not the same concentration, but there's something that's the same about the two solutions. Not the volume. Not molarity, that's concentration. Not the pH. What is the one thing that ties all things together? <laughs> Moles, moles, so at equivalence point, the moles are the same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's the moles. Equivalence means the moles are the same. pH is relevant, but yeah. Uh, yeah, since we haven't talked about pH yet, uh, but like the pH of the two solutions, not the same, the pH at the equivalence point might be seven. Depends on what you're titrating. Uh, okay, so if the number of moles at the equivalence point is the same, and it took this amount of potassium hydroxide solution of that concentration to reach the equivalence point, that means however many moles are here is how many moles are gonna be of acid are in the sulfuric acid solution. Now, there's another thing that we need here that's not specifically given, and not specifically asked for, and that's a balanced chemical equation. So a reaction is between potassium hydroxide and sulfuric acid. So you have KOH plus H2SO4. What are our products? 
Water. Water. And potassium sulfate, and that's going to be K2SO4. Now, I have to balance this. The potassium hydroxide only has one hydroxide, but sulfuric acid has two hydrogens. So we're going to be titrating for both of those hydrogens. Uh, so it's probably easier though to look at just right, the number of potassiums, right? One potassium, two potassiums. So we need two hydroxides, potassium hydroxides. And then what else needs a two? H2O. So this is a great example of where the sulfate, even though it has oxygen in it, you don't really need to consider those oxygens because they're always going to stay with the sulfate. So right, these oxygens are kind of irrelevant. The only other place we have oxygen is from the hydroxide. So the reason we need to do this is that it takes two potassium hydroxides for every sulfuric acid. So we actually need twice as much potassium hydroxide to react with all of the sulfuric acid. Because it's not quite a, quite that the number of moles is the same. So how do we find how many moles of potassium hydroxide solution we used? Or sorry, moles of potassium hydroxide. Molarity and the volume. Let's start with the volume. And uh, I'm gonna convert it into liters. So 0 0.02287 liters of KOH. Ah. The straight and narrow. Okay. And then we're going to use the concentration. And again, that can be 0 0.158 moles per liter. KOH. So 0 0.158 moles, KOH, one liter, KOH. And what's the mole ratio? What mole ratio do we want to use? Potassium hydroxide to sulfuric acid, exactly. So it's, yeah, two hydroxides. Two potassium hydroxides for every one mole of H2SO4. And that's going to tell us how many moles of H2SO4 there are. So 0 0.02287 times 0 0.158 divided by 2. Not very many moles. 0 0.00180436. H2SO4. But we want to know the concentration. 0 0.00180436 moles. Uh, divided by 0 0.020 liters, zero, 0, zero. Did I have something in wrong? I did. Uh, divided by two. All right, this is slightly off. Uh, this should be six, seven, three. I hit a four instead of a seven at some point. And then that divided by 0.02, there we go. 
0 0.0904 molar H2SO4. So even though we had added 22.87 milliliters of a solution to our 20 milliliter sample, why are we still using just the 20 milliliters instead of those two volumes together? Yeah, we want to know the concentration of what it was before we diluted it, before we reacted it. So we use that initial concentration when we're doing these titrate, or the, sorry, the initial volume when we're doing titration problems. Um, in the problems on the worksheet tonight, which I still have to go print, uh, there are a lot of problems, there, there are situations where you've, we're not doing a titration, but you're just mixing two things together, and so the final new volume is what you need to use for those molarity calculations. All right.